Jazz Podcast. In conversation with musicians from the UK jazz scene. And now your hosts, Rob Cope and Dan Farrant. There he is. Hello and welcome. Hey. Yeah, I'm here in a big yeah. way. You're in a big way? Mm. <laughs> I said I'm here in a big way, but I'm not really big sure what I, what I meant by that. Okay. Yeah. It's... How's, how's it going? Yeah, good. For, everything's under control. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks, mate. Fine, fine. Ex- fine. Excellent, excellent. So, um, so I've moved house and now we live really even closer to each other than before. So we can carry on not seeing each other outside of recording podcasts. No, we will. <laughs> sure. We're going to go climbing. I just need oh, a, great. I need a few weeks to finish unpacking and sort my life yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you? What's going on? I'm at a climbing wall. Oh, speaking of climbing, eh? Yeah. Wow. Um, what Where are you? you? What are you doing there? Just climbing stuff? Uh, yeah, I will be. I'll do some bouldering. That sounds cool. Yeah. What about you? What are you doing? I am at our old pal Jake's place. We're actually just watching South oh, Park. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Very... So Jake said he couldn't come climbing today because he was busy. He, he is. It's a very, <laughs> very small South Park and podcast window. Yes. Yeah, it's ideal. Um, uh, so, yeah, yeah. Um, what are we going to talk about? About ourselves, I suppose. About Malcolm Edmondson. It's... Yes, that's probably why we're here, isn't it? It is why. Though it's finally the time. We've mm. been sitting on this one for a while. What's uh, What have we got to look forward to? Oh, yeah. Well, um, th- we've got to look forward to some children running around. Um, I apologise in advance for the children. Um, that's probably not your apology, is it? Well, I've tried to edit them out um, yeah. as best I can. But it's a bit noisy uh, in okay. places. But it's fun. Um, cool. Malcolm's a, a very uh, talented gentleman, so it's kind of fun to just not say anything stupid if I can. Okay. Um, so there's Good. all that, and um, while we're here, mm. I'm going to just drop in that uh, if you are itching to to come see some live music. Um, have and, you got a gig? Yeah, I have. Yes. And that's where. <laughs> Cha-ching! <laughs> that's where this is going um my band gods of apollo is playing at the cambridge jazz festival in uh, on the 23rd of november 2019 yeah that's it it's two weeks great yeah and uh actually playing in the london jazz festival the next oh well. yeah, yeah. flang yeah um with a Where are you playing in the london jazz festival that one a sunday the 24th the, the music of george gershwin Oh, uh, it's that's called sick. the Invest Suite. Yeah, it's cool. It's supposed to be. It's in some someone's square. Uh, is this some, wait a minute. What have we got here? St John Smith Square. St John Smith Square. Yeah. Cool. Um, and that's at half seven. Uh, I was doing it. Uh, we were rehearsing last weekend, and mm. I'm I'm playing uh, a lot of flute, and also in the woodwind section is like Sam Rapley and James Allsop and. Um, Helena Gordon, Harry Wynn Stanley, they're both flautists and everyone's yeah. playing away. And, uh, uh, you know, I sort of, as I often do, I got lost and, um, yeah. <laughs> and the whole thing fell apart. Nick Smart's conducting it and he stopped the band and he went, Oh my God, Rob, such is your power. You just brought down the entire watering <laughs> section. <laughs> I was going to say, that's quite a, a struggle to a, one flute player to bring it to a standstill yeah just Amazing. just me that's that yeah it was one of my yeah. finest moments oh sad sad yeah. times i was like if i'm you know if i'm going down i'm taking everybody <laughs> <Bring> every <laughs> i thought no one would know if everyone got lost then my tracks would yeah. be covered yeah but <laughs> <laughs> still oh, it's good to be out of the house absolutely yeah um Shall we play this interview? Oh, yeah, let's go. All right, here it comes. Malcolm Edmonston, welcome to the Jazz oh, Podcast. Oh, my goodness, such a pleasure to be here. Oh, man, this is wonderful. It's we're, great, isn't it? We're in the, the festival hall, the, the HQ. In the Claw Ballroom, no less. In fact, mm. We're on the stage. 
we're literally on the stage. It's lovely, isn't it? There's children. There's two children orbiting they are the stage. The time of their lives. Yeah. So um, they'll tire soon, but <laughs> in the meantime, I apologise. Um, so, um, well, uh, what should we talk about? Where did you grow up? I grew up in a small town in Scotland called Perth. It's 42 mm. miles north of Edinburgh. It's, it's lovely. It's very nice. Was Perth Australia named after Perth, Scotland? Correct. As I believe, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. That... It would make sense to be that way around, mm. I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How is it growing up in Perth? Um, well, it's different now. I mean, I spent quite a lot of time in Scotland still. My folks are there. And, you know, I, of course, I grew up before the internet. Yes. Imagine that. I often try and explain to my students what it was like to grow up before YouTube. But they just look at you like you're insane. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. My, my dad had AOL. Mm. In, in like 95 or something and it was like pretty dial up cutting edge dial up mm-hmm. yeah of course yeah it was pretty cool but um, it's not really that relevant is it sorry but, you know, <laughs> straight into the dial up into <laughs> yeah I can't remember the brand of modem but what I remember is like my mum shouting upstairs being like who's using who's the phone who's using the phone, <laughs> you yeah, use the phone. The phone. oh my god <laughs> well this is the thing so growing up in a small town I mean, we were so lucky because uh, you still see this now. It's basically, there's either a jazz teacher or there's not. Mm. I went to very ordinary secondary school, very ordinary. Um, but there was this amazing pair of protect teachers, like a saxophone player, woodwind right. player. Yeah, like really great. It's called Philip Alexander from Wales, and then he went to Trinity. And he was at Trinity at the same time as Julian Arguelles and Simon Purcell and um, Jim Rettigan mm. and that lot and Lockhart, I think. And as I understand it, at that time at Trinity, of course, like way predates there being a you know like a jazz degree course. Yeah. But there was a lot of improvisation. Yeah. There was a lot of improvising and there was a lot of playing. There were a lot of players who, like yourself, but I'm sure the listeners will know your heritage, but having studied Hopefully classical deeply. Mm. undergraduate, I think there was a lot of that going on. And of course, because you couldn't go and study jazz, well, you could at Leeds, but because you couldn't, go and study, you couldn't really study jazz in London, I guess the colleges were full of jazz players because they wanted to go to music college. So there yeah. was always a there was always a scene there was always the northern people. was exactly like that yeah there was a great jazz scene there yeah and you had great jazz teachers there yeah and it really bonded me very tightly with the other musicians yes because you were more reliant on each other yeah sometimes like someone would like we'd be like rehearsing the group of us that were really into playing jazz yeah and someone would be like oh I've been trying this thing or that and you uh-huh. kind of learn together and do you know what I think there's a massive amount to be said for learning something when it's not the singular thing that you're supposed to be learning mm. kind of takes the pressure off a bit doesn't it it's a bit like you know like learning to cook it's like well I'm a jazz musician I better be good at that but I don't have to be good at cooking as long as I don't poison anyone <laughs> like yeah. I can just experiment and then you you notice your development much you, 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 the, the kind of increments of your development are like proportionally huge compared to my increments of development as a jazz musician now. Yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I mean? Mm. And yeah, that's oh, yeah. quite inspiring. So I, I kind of like that vibe. Anyway, M- Philip, I almost called him Mr. Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have to say that anymore. <laughs> anyway, he was a great teacher and he he was, uh, he kind of introduced us, I say us, but it was me and a guy called uh, Nick Dover. He's a great tenor player who went to the academy and we, we were at school together so that was it. We had, I played piano, he played saxophone. Boom done yeah I mean we didn't even know what a rhythm section was really but we could make music together and we did all the time yeah you know and we're both into improvising so we had each other I think if we hadn't had each other we probably wouldn't have done it yeah you know because it's such a it's it's a weird one isn't it to do on your own of course these days there is no on your own because of YouTube or 
mm. online learning, and all, all of these sort of great things. There's all the kind of community feel of it, which can be virtual now, but we didn't have that. Music shop didn't have any jazz records. I mean, I was lucky because my, my parents are good musicians, really good, and my my dad had some Oscar Peterson records, so mm. I was like, yes. I was like, as soon as I heard it, I think they rather wanted me to be a classical player, but unfortunately, I was terrible. I reckon Oscar's ruined a lot of potential I think classical this is musicians. True. And another classic archetype for a jazz piano player is that I was a chorister. Mm. And I loved that. I mean, I loved singing. Yeah. It was so, it was so brilliant. And I was, you know, boy treble and all that stuff. But, you know, having the music in front of you and seeing all the other parts, it's just like the best mm -hmm. training. And I, objectively, it's really hard. It's a really hard thing to do, but it didn't seem hard at the time. And everybody else just did it. I remember there being boys in the choir who were, it was cathedral choir, but, like, I mean, it's Perth, so it's like not, it's not like, it's very far from being like a cathedral school or a yeah. choir school or anything like yeah. that. But, you know, I remember there being other people in the choir who were, like, good at football or, do, do you know what I mean? It wasn't all people just from musical families. Yes. Yeah. So, everyone just kind of marked in and got on with it and we would sing Finzi and Bax and um, like all that English pastoral stuff and it's amazing yeah it's absolutely brilliant mm. so I'm, I'm very grateful for that really yeah it's um, it's funny how you don't know I don't think at the time the music that's going to affect you correct yeah. and I wish I'd had more of a appreciation for the idea that like western classical music and jazz it's not that much different really no. you know and is it isn't it interesting now that jazz musicians are falling over themselves to tell you the classical music that they mm. dig you know it's like really kind of on trend yeah i'm not suggesting that in any way pejoratively but people are desperate to talk about classical music yeah in a way i think when i was coming up when I was studying jazz it wasn't like that people weren't using uh, classical music as a jumping off point mm -hmm. for jazz it was it was much more it was a bit more tunnel vision-y yeah yeah I saw um, Brad Meldow was at the um, the Barbican a few months ago yeah and it was all bar well know? yeah I mean the, he kind of he kind of changed it all didn't he mm -hmm. I mean that's and it was such an important time at the, at the turn of the century there, <laughs> you know, to have this player who was so steeped in the tradition. And of course, you listen to him with Joshua Redman, and mm. it's like, oh my God, that's like a. It's a bit like when you hear John Taylor play straight ahead. You're like, oh, well, mm. of course he can do that. It's just on on like his records or Kenny Wheeler's records, he's not doing that. But of mm -hmm. course he can do mm. that, or could sadly, and yeah. he obviously. Tried, so sad to have lost him. John was one of the big inspirations for getting this podcast started. Really? Yeah, when he died, obviously it was so sad. Yeah. But it was also like the driving force wow, behind that's like. that's amazing. Like, you, I was like, that, that you can't waste a single second yeah. here, assuming that people will be. Because obviously John died uh, seemingly uh, very active and healthy. Yeah. You know? It was a really I big know. shock. So. Um, yeah, that was a right kick to wow, be like, okay, lovely, it's time. Yeah. We better get out the door and start talking to people. Well, that's <laughs> that's a beautiful thing, yeah. And I think, um, I mean, we're so blessed in Britain to have and to have had so many ridiculous musicians who are, you know, when you look at the scene, that scene kind of in the in the sixties, you know, I mean, those everyone was ridiculous. Yeah, so many great players and and such a rich kind of uh, you know it wasn't it wasn't just the um, it, wasn't, it wasn't just jazz gigs but there were of course so many of those and so many venues but you know they're all like in the studios as well during the day and yeah. Kenny Wheeler and so many just sitting in a trumpet section and all that. Yeah. You know, it's that. Stan Saltzman told me once he was doing a session back in the 60s or 70s, yeah. you know, in London and he was, he couldn't see 
that he could just, he was in there, I think the woodwind section, you know, and you could hear someone playing on the piano, and he was like, "Man, that sounds unbelievable." He said he like peered around the glass to see, and it was Herbie Hancock. Oh no way! Yeah, yeah but he didn't like. No one had told him, you know. You just, but that like the idea that the world was ever like that—that that yeah. there'd be enough like. Imagine though, you know. Do you know what? Sufficient. I think that story might actually be about. I think it might be more recent than that because stands on that Johnny Mitchell record, both sides now. Yes. You know what? I think that is more recent because I think Ian Dixon was also in the room. Yeah, it's nineteen ninety. And Ian's too young to be yes. in the sixties. Yeah. yeah, cool. It's, um, yeah, and that that was amazing. And so someone in the string section famously asked for the piano to be turned down. And, um, <laughs> <it was> like, <laughs> that's that one where you like like you want to pull an eject lever. Yeah, yeah. Like, I know. That's so, hilarious. I mean, it's I mean, it is difficult getting a balance, but. Well, it's Herbie, oh my God. Yeah. Like, do you know what? I think Stan is like the greatest musician. Like, he's absolutely untouchable. In his, like, obviously in his artistry, but in his skills as well. He's yeah. just, just so good. <laughs> it's like you hear him solo or something. And it's like, I've spoken to Nick Smart about this. Obviously, he's like super, like, I mean, he knows Stan and he knew Kenny so well. And um, he's a real kind of uh, sort of uh, expert on, on, the, on this British scene much more than I am. But I remember speaking to Nick about how if, if it wasn't for Stan, then there's a whole kind of raft of British saxophone players that wouldn't potentially sound yeah. like they do. I, like, You know, the first time I heard Stan play, uh, rightly or wrongly, my first reaction was like, I can't believe he's English. Something about yeah. the sound and the way he played, I was like, I didn't know English people could play well, like this. Well, you know what? I think with Stan, it's his time. Yes. I think his, ti- his time is yeah. so American. Yeah. And Stan's got that beautiful thing that... Nikki Isles talks about uh, which is like finding the blues in anything yeah. you know like you don't you don't save the blues for when you're playing our blues or playing bluesy oh, it's a terrible yeah. term isn't yeah. it <laughs> you know but you could you could be on a kind of like uh, you know C major chord with a uh, a raised ninth and a raised eleventh and players like Stan will find the the, the the blues within that sound yeah you know and I yeah. think that's that's a brilliant thing you know like because there's a conversation isn't there like can you well I don't think you can have our music without that heritage I yeah. mean you can't you can't you can't I don't think I mean it's it sounds so vanilla when you hear someone playing and there's no I mean, I don't want to hear the blues scale ever in my entire yes. life, but I'm not talking about that. It's not really scale, is it? <laughs> Lockhart says it's, it's not a blues scale, it's a rock scale. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, like, that, that sensibility. Those, the corners in the, in, the, in the selection of notes that you're going to use. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, trying to get, trying to wring something out of the harmony and not make it sound... Vanilla, yeah, and I think you know when you when you <laughs> it's really interesting, isn't it? Because like we all study Kenny Wheeler's music, and our students are like, "Oh, not more Kenny Wheeler," not because they don't love it, but because they obviously sort of slightly force feed it. Because it is like the most, I would argue, it's the most harmonically sound music for a for a student at yeah. a particular stage yeah. like if you can get through we do a thing where we take all the sequences from the first disc of music for loud and small ensembles and if you can get through those you can pretty much play anything there's not a great deal of harmonic major stuff in there there's yeah. a bit yeah. it's a bit in, the, uh, in that cool slow one yeah. but if you can get through that you can you, in in my mind, just you're, you're sort of done, you know. Yeah. And but when you listen to him play or John Taylor play, 
they don't play what's there. They kind of play what what's not there as well. Yeah, you know. And I think that's it's it's, it's easy if if you fall into that first camp of, of just like right, okay, the, those are the notes, and here we go. Then there is a danger of the of the vanilla about it, or if you you, you can't get your own message out, you, yeah. it becomes like an exercise. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's always the kind of question you know you play a standard it's obvious because you don't want to sound like everyone else playing yeah. that standard can you apply that to these frameworks it's hard isn't it very I watched John Ter- there's the, like the greatest privilege of my whole education was to just sit in a little master class with Kenny Kenny wasn't really speaking um, it was like the whole of the 85th anniversary oh yeah, yeah, yeah you know so Kenny was supposed to be doing the <coughs> class but the rest of the band came in to listen yeah yeah and um, there was a moment within this where John Taylor and Evan Parker were talking to each other yeah. in front of everyone yeah. about... It was great because it wasn't, like, planned. This conversation just sort of unfolded of, uh. of, of, of Evan saying that he kind of wants to play the way over changes how John plays so freely. There's wow. chords there, but John's just doing wow. whatever he wants. Yeah. And, it fits. and John's saying, I want to play like you. Oh, my God. You know, you're, you're not bound by a harmonic construct and you're just playing whatever language you want yeah. you know and, and 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 I remember you know Evan saying his his goal with the music was to try and be able to read it yeah and and John was saying my dream is to be like you I just want to yeah, hear yeah. it all and not look at anything isn't it amazing and, to hear people at that level who we all adore like you know being so open yeah so and gentle about you know what, what, where they're trying to get to and like gentlemen at the time who are you know like in their sort of sixth, seventh decade, yeah, still, still searching for that. Yeah, and so hungry to learn and yeah. and better themselves musically. Well, here's the thing, and I I think the thing is like I think Wayne Shorter is a massive part of this. Yeah, because when you hear Wayne Shorter, he's always searching, isn't he? Yeah, he's always he's always reaching for something that's not there. Yeah, and I think. You can hear that in certain people's playing, in a lot of people's playing. Yeah. But I think that's a highly attractive thing. And do you know what? When I was when I was twenty, like eight years ago, it's a joke. <laughs> uh, um, I didn't I didn't get that at all. Yeah. Like I kind of wanted to hear the delivery of the thing. Yeah. Uh, I didn't yeah. want to hear like stuff around the thing. I know what you mean. It's a bit of a tease. It is. You know? Yeah. And it's, and I don't know, maybe it's like life experience or just growing as a person, all that stuff, sort of stuff. But when I, when I finally, when I finally got it, and it's not that I, I, I've always adored Wayne Shorter, but when I finally got it and I understood that the, the thing about searching, about reaching for something that was beyond what might be the obvious. Yeah. It was like, it was like clouds parting you know it's such a beautiful thing and I try I try to play like that and I, I, I have quite a lot of language in my playing that, that of course is what you're aiming for when you're young and then when you get older you, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's not a curse but yeah. it's slightly like don't oh, stop doing that you know mm. you know you've played that before so I think I think that's really helped me you know just that just that one idea and I'm really interested with with younger or people who are like slightly earlier in their journey improvising it's not really to do with age is it it's just to do with experience yeah. just to do with like it's like hours <laughs> yeah. hours on the clock yeah <laughs> yeah um, I'm, I'm really interested that something like that what I'm talking about with pointing out this thing about Wayne reaching for something maybe someone could hear that and that could change their play mm-hmm it's nothing to do with me, but what my point is that at that at that time when you're studying hard, you think it's all about getting more stuff, putting more stuff in. Yeah. Actually, comes a point where, like, just a concept, you know, something philosophical can can be a switch. Yeah. And you can go, wow, okay, I can reinvent everything I've already yeah. got with that. Yeah. Completely. Mark Lockhart very kindly did exactly that to me one day. Did he? After his podcast, I was complaining 
about how many things I'm still trying to get around. Uh-huh. I don't know why. I must have been in a mood and I was like, oh, Mark, I'm sick of this standard and I can't yeah. play over that. And he was just like, stop it. Stop yeah, it. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I was, must have been already <clears throat> 28. And, and he was like, you know, I'm sorry for the listeners. I've said this loads of times. But he said to me, it's time to stop worrying about the things that you can't do yeah. and start focusing on the things yeah. that you can do. Yeah. You know, it's like, if you want to make an album, ask yourself, what can you do? Yeah. You know, and it was like, it's yeah. like, it seems like such a silly fundamental thing to, to have overlooked, but for a whole lifetime of like the pursuit of betterness yeah. to just sit back and be like, okay, how yeah. do I want to play? Yeah. What do I like? Maybe yeah. it's okay that I can't play moments notice in all 12 keys yeah. at this point. What do life. you mean you can't? <laughs> you know? I know. I know. I know. Shocker. <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, what well, Lock, Lockhart's a brilliant example of just a ridiculous musician, and I, w- I wonder if there's something about that loose tube scene where, like, they were really young and they were doing like this music that was very political and had a huge following outside jazz fans. And it, it was like, for want of a better word, there's like definitely a sort of punk element to that. I don't yeah. mean the style, but, yeah. you know, the movement, yeah, and. To be doing that when you're that young and to have that acclaim and to, to do it as a collective and for people to be massively into it, I mean, it must give a lot of confidence. Yeah. It must be like, wow, okay, well, I know I can't do everything, but people are digging this and that's they can only hear the stuff I can do. So I wonder if that's sort of set something yeah. in their DNA. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of confidence. Uh, I, think, I think being cocky and being confident completely different yeah you know yeah and I think I think and I think we do maybe culturally as a a nation do tend to be a bit underconfident a bit down on ourselves and worry about the things that we can't do and part of that comes from formalised education as well because it becomes like you know you can't you can't have a course that it doesn't have tasks or hoops yeah. you have to jump through and then that creates anxiety and oh, it's, it's a really difficult balance, you know. And I don't want to be hypocritical, you, but you need that You need that rigour. But at the same time, you know, it's like it should be... You're, you're so right to concentrate, like what Mark said about concentrating on the things you can do. Yeah. I did this thing at... At college this year, where so you're head of jazz at Guildhall. Correct. How much of the course are you setting or changing? Have you made any big adjustments yeah, to massive. the work? Since massive, you took yeah. Over? I mean, it was a great course. It's always been a great course, and I, I really loved it as a student. And uh, and yeah, yeah, I've changed a lot of things. I've got a great team of people. We've got like almost a hundred staff. Yeah. Like no, I don't mean like full time. Yeah. I mean people that come in. Yeah. Like pretty much everyone we've mentioned. Yeah. So far, it's just for us. You know, it's it's amazing. I mean, I and I think the thing is, I think the thing is, in London, and I'm not. If I mention three colleges, I'm not, that's not to exclude any all the other great places you can study jazz because there are lots of them. But with what Nick's doing at the academy and Hans at Trinity and what I'm trying, Hans Collar's try, head Hans of jazz, Collar, isn't he? He's head of jazz at Trinity, and. I mean, just 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 in those three colleges. I mean, there is so much, there's such a huge kind of opportunity. There's so much mm. that you can do. I think London is a brilliant place to study jazz. Yeah, and and the UK. I mean, it's amazing what's going on at Birmingham and everything. Else. It's got its own sort of aesthetic. Yeah, I don't think Germany would mind me saying that. You know, it's like they've got they've got like a vibe. Got yeah. like stuff going on, and it's and it's different. I think the colleges have identity, and I think that's really positive. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I, 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 you know, not that you've asked this question, but a lot of people say like, oh, you know, like, uh, what's the difference for you in the academy or whatever? I'm like, and I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in those conversations at all because I'm really into coffee, right? Yeah. Like really into yeah. coffee. And so, if a great coffee shop opens up on like a on a, in a neighbourhood and it's the first great coffee shop right yeah and then people get into coffee and they kind of get upgraded so some people are going from like Costa or whatever and you know other people are coming from like a 
mid mid range sort of chain and people are like wow well, speciality coffee is a thing and yeah you know yeah it's there's a bit of trendiness to it but actually there's an amazing flavors you can have and they get into that and then because that neighbor who's got this amazing coffee shop another amazing coffee shop opens up yeah. right now I know a lot of people in coffee they th- that is just that is brilliant yeah for the neighborhood for the residents hopefully yeah you know for coffee <laughs> yeah do you know what I mean like th- it's great for them because nobody wants to go to the same place every day yeah you know yeah it's it makes it like a sort of destination thing that gives variety so it's like all the independents versus all the chains yeah and I see jazz education like that. It's like yeah. the more kind of connected we can be, you know, we don't have a versus. Yeah. What I mean is like we're all we're all like working really hard to try and do the yeah. best job we can yeah. to like help help people to on, on their journey with jazz. It's like it's like jazz together, you know, like Yeah, Martin Speak was my first teacher. Oh, when I had yeah. a consultation with Martin, he was like, Well, I teach at Academy and at Trinity. Yeah. yeah, he was like, wherever you go, you're yeah. going to be stuck with me. <laughs> so. He's a great teacher, Martin. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He's really, like... He, I mean, he's a really, exa- a really good, interesting example of someone who has, like, a, a teaching philosophy and a playing philosophy, and they're both very well developed. And you don't necessarily hear all of his teaching in all of his playing yeah. do you know what I mean they've got yeah. like their own identity oh totally yeah and because he's really into like standards and 12 keys like I am and all of that sort of stuff yeah. like he sounds amazing playing standards but that's not what you hear if you go to like a Martin Speak gig yeah. you know you're going to hear yeah. like a, a whole different thing yeah totally no I feel like that he never the lessons I had with him in no way reflected his personal playing style. yeah and I, I think that's really admirable I think to do that as a yeah. teacher is great because you there, co- there comes a point in your education I'm sure you'll agree where you know you need like artistic direction yeah and you need someone to to pick you up and go you've got skills you've got stuff to say this is how you're going to do it yeah like Bellamy or someone like that do you yeah. know what I mean like one of those like people who's like a, like they're just going to give you that vision yeah right? and that's awesome and there's other there's other lessons where you need someone to go you can't do this if you're going to be a jazz musician you're going to have to do this yeah here we go yeah you know and I think that's I think both I think you have to have both of those yeah you know yeah I think you, you need both sides of the coin and I don't in any way mean to single out those two incredible musicians I'm just pointing out that you know, there's some. I'm not saying the other can't do the other yeah. at all. I feel like you can hear it though when somebody avoids going through the Great American Songbook. Oh man! You know, totally. Like you say about the language, it, it, there's something missing, regardless of how you end up playing. Well, one of my bugbears is that I think cadence has fallen out of fashion. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, and like people who listen to this going, all right, Brian Dad, you know, <laughs> this is this is not a criticism of music that doesn't have cadence. It's, it's. I'm. I'm just slightly sad that cadence doesn't like like people's ears. Yeah. Necessarily, because I think cadence is. If you listen to Herbie, I do this. I've got this one lesson with it. There's a great solo that I think you'll find listeners or like. It's, it's on. It's on the new standard, which I'll be recorded in 1996. It's like pop, is that with Michael pop Brecker? songs. Yeah. Yeah. Brecker, Schofield. Yeah. Yeah. Dave Holland. That is a really Jack sick Jeanette, album. Don yeah. Elias. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great album. Weird production. Slightly weird production. Slightly yeah. Quite kind of like in your facey. I quite like it. Yeah. But um it's a, a song called Love is Stronger Than Pride and the chords go thus. Uh, we should get one of those pianos off of yeah I mean we would get thrown out but we shouldn't get thrown out we will <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the chords go like should be like um <laughs> is it no never mind carry on um four bars of each chord D flat minor 11 F minor 11 E major A flat major that's it okay yeah. so it's like it's modal it's a bit of symmetry 
the major chords are relative to the minor chords. It's beautiful. It sounds amazing. But there's no there's no cadence. There's no five one. There's no yeah. C five one. And I do this lesson where I look at and Harry just plays four choruses. Uh, but I look at in each chorus what he does in order to impose cadence on yeah. static harmony. Yeah. And a lot of this comes from Simon Purcell. I mean, he was really, really staunchly into that. When I was at college, like I studied with Simon, which was the greatest thing ever. And I studied with Pete Churchill a little later, which was yeah. also the greatest thing ever. Joint, joint greatest things ever. Um, Pete taught me to like it when it's too caught in a bar. I used to be like really ah, into modal stuff. Right, yeah, like, yeah. But there's no help for you there. Oh, you're going to have to do a lot thing, of work. Yeah. Like what you're saying right now about Herbie. When it's modal, yeah, you've yeah. actually got to do a lot of yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, you've got to do a lot of work. yourself yeah. to not be in a desert. Yeah, exactly. Now, and that, and you've brilliantly made my point for me. Yes. Like, a, like an excellent <laughs> podcast presenter would. Which is that like you can't... Like imposing cadence on static harmony is fun times. <laughs> you can't impose cadence on static harmony if you ain't got cadence. Yeah. And that's the thing. And I think that's, you know, I think it's really important. I think it's really important because functional harmony rocks. Yeah. It rocks so much. Yeah. And we know, like, why do we like Steely Dan? We like Steely Dan because it's, well, for a whole host of reasons, but, like, core to that is the fact that it's jazz harmony. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's so exciting. Yeah. It moves. It moves in mysterious ways sometimes. Yeah. But it has... Cadence. It's cadential music. It's not. It's not two five cadence. But man, it's like it's kind of as harmonically sophisticated as Kenny Wheeler. Yeah. You know, in a, in a yeah. totally different way. Yeah. Um. Transcription. Oh, well, you haven't asked about. It. I'm just. I'm just asking. The <laughs> hey, Malcolm, how do you feel about transcription? Well, <laughs> it's a bit tangential, isn't it? Sorry, but I, I always think like it's a weird thing that people transcribe solos so much. Mm-hmm. You know, what I'm into is transcribing not even tunes, just like, the, you know, writing out a rhythm chart for a song. Yeah. I'm so into that. Anything, any song. Like, just writing out one chart that would be enough to give to the rhythm section and, and play that song. Yeah. And I think if you want to learn to improvise, transcribe solos. If you want to learn to hear, transcribe harmony yeah like get it written down figure it out whatever it is start start with Chuck Berry if you have to yeah you know just start with start with stuff that's like easy yeah you know but get it down it's an accomplishment yeah you know if you if you when you go to bed if there's some if you've done something or you've learned something if you have something that you didn't have when you woke up success yeah yeah <laughs> That's the way I feel. Yeah. And I think it's really important. You know? Yeah. You get more from that than necessarily doing the sixth chorus and, like, dealing with the septuplets. And, oh, is it, is it like, a 13 in 7? Oh, how am I going to write this? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. that's so detailed. It's really important, but actually just being able to write out, like, a set of changes. I do it on the bus. Well, train. Yeah. You know? write out stuff all the time yeah of course that's really useful because quite often people need it so that's like a great skill yeah you know but just I would say to anyone just try and write out a course for something. I really want to do like a like a radio program on harmony for people that aren't necessarily musicians yeah you know I think it'd be a great thing just to talk about like tonic subdominant and dominant chords and chord four minor and the amount you can do with that and how uh, the harmony of, of the South you know as it came up the Mississippi Delta blues and, the, and music from the church I think gospel music is so important to, to what we do Yeah, how that kind of influenced the the great American songbook writers and how that in turn influenced the jazz musicians yeah. and I think it would be so great just to be able to kind of share some of that you know so this I assume is how you would have learned to be so harmonically versatile thank you very much yeah <laughs> just like writing down tunes listening to things figuring out what's going on yeah I mean if you my my educational philosophy is like three categories input process output yeah right and traditional 
music learning concentrates on output. Yes. Technique. Yeah. The instrument, the sound, time, all that sort of stuff. Now, that's completely invaluable. You can't not have that. Yeah. It's interesting, we were chatting before. Uh, listeners, I'll give you a little recap. So, Rob was saying he was a uh, classical, uh, contemporary classical major at the Royal Northern College of Music. And then he was saying, oh, that probably made him an excellent, like, master's jazz candidate because you had all of the instrument. The and output. You, have, you had all the output yeah. and you were so thirsty, yeah. I guess, yeah. for the input and the process. Yeah. And yeah, like, I, I wouldn't, like, yeah, just like, how do I write an eight bar functional harmony chord sequence? Yeah. I wouldn't have known yeah. where to yeah. even go about and, yeah. I, and Pete said to me once, like, you know, when you're trying to write something, nothing's going to come out. If you don't, I, his exact words were, if you don't serve your intuition, it won't serve you. Mm. But That's cool. I was like, ah, yeah. I have to learn things. You have to, yeah, you have to get them in. <laughs> yeah. 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 And why is moments note as hard? It's because we haven't practiced like chromatic two fives that start on the lower one. Yeah. You know, like yeah. the sound of that is foreign. Like, because the first thing we hear, E minor seventh, we're like, okay, we're going to D. Yeah. Oh, no, we're not going to D. It's slip sliding away. Okay, in that case, we're definitely going to D flat. Yeah. That's common. Yeah. E minor, A7, E flat minor, A flat seven, boom. But, you know, it's just not familiar to us. It's not in our ears. Yeah. And once you, you know, it's a good example of something that you can't, you can't fudge. You can't fudge moments notice. No. No way. No. Absolutely no. not. You have to think in every way. You have to think vertically and horizontally at the same time. You have to be aware of your tonal center and you have to be aware of the the, the cadence. Yeah. You know? yeah. And things like that. You know, I've, I don't in any way shy away from things that are challenges. I yeah. Think challenge is really important. It's just that at some point you need to go, okay, I've done the challenges, jump through the hoops. This is my thing. Like we, we did a thing at college where... I think it's worked out really well. Like all the mid years, uh, mid year exams are like hoop jumpers. Yeah. Like, so we say like you have to do this. You have to play these tunes. You have to play these tunes. Like first years, like pick a standard, then they have to modulate up a major third. Yeah. Every chorus, yeah. all that sort of stuff. You know, rhythm changes in B flat and E alternate yeah. choruses. You know, moments notes in the original key. That's yeah. hard enough in second year. <clears throat> whatever whatever it might be, you know, a whole bunch of things that are sort of like traditionally tricky. Yeah. But all the end of years are like your thing. Yeah. Show us your artistry. Yeah. Show us what show us what you're doing with it all. Yeah. Or with you're doing with the rest of the stuff that you're getting from wherever. And that's the great thing that there's so much music to listen to now and it's so it's so easy to to hear it. That folks are listening to stuff that certainly like I've I've never heard of. And yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing discovering music through the students. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, I feel like that. I was teaching someone this morning, and she was talking about a few bands that she'd heard recently, and I was just like, I was like, oh, she's like, this is keeping me young. I yeah. hear this, yeah, you yeah. know, because oh, I'm you like, are young. I'm just slipping away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so how do you mark an end of year oh, then if it's super broad? No. I mean, like, yeah. Oh, that's the worst question ever. <laughs> Have you got an edit button on this or what? Yeah, I do. A big one. We could bleep this oh, entire jazz section. jazz assessment is so It tricky. must be hard. It's, it's incredibly hard. I'm an external examiner at a few other places as well, so see that it's hard for everyone. It's not yeah. just hard for us. Yeah. And do you know what I mean? If we go on those jazz education conferences, it's like, Day one, welcome. Yeah. Thanks for traveling halfway around the world. The first session is on jazz assessments. <laughs> oh, it's really difficult. Yeah. It's really difficult to try and... I've, what, what I try and instill is a notion of process over style. You know, so once a student has the skills, I don't mind what they do with them. Right. And then it becomes a question of like, is there improvisational process in evidence? Yes. You know? Yeah. If you're not jumping through a hoop, you're doing your own music. You can, or or you, can, you can play like a, a set of like 
Jelly Roll Morton tunes. Like, it's not that you have to do original yeah, music. Yeah. You can do whatever you like, yeah. or you can just play standards. It, but it's like, that, the point is, it's your choice to do that. Yeah. And so, assessment is hard. I, I have quite big panels, so there's quite a few opinions. Yeah. And we have a cool thing, which is pretty standard in higher education, called blind marking. So for a final recital, uh, you get to the end of it, and everyone will write down a number. Yeah. Privately. Yeah. And then pass the numbers to the chair. The chair will go, okay, it's like a, it's a seventy-six. Is it, is it like a like a like the lottery. You know, oh my like god! One don't, don't say that. You'll get me in trouble. <laughs> it's nothing it's... like the lottery. Oh damn. Um, yeah, and you get the three numbers, and like, then... it's more like diving. Uh... You know, in the Olympics, when they're like, 8.5, 8.5, no, yeah. no. They do it all privately, and then it's made public. And oh, then like, right, yeah. yeah. It's like that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and then we and then we chat about it. And it is amazing, because we've always got an external as well. And it's amazing, like, I'm usually uh, pretty, it's pretty, like, close. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think, it's very difficult, but we, we try our best, and we're always looking at new ways of doing it. Yeah. What a tough question, Rob. I'm just, just yeah, it's, I'm just fascinated. <laughs> Again, it's not. I'm not like accusing anyone no, of it not being good. It's always. It's never been a thing where I've thought, well, there's a problem right there. Yeah. No, Personally, sure. it yeah. seems like the idea. Not that anyone cares what I think. But the idea of studying at music college, being taught as much as you can possibly maintain, but then crucially, the final exams being free to do whatever you want. Yeah. That's amazing. What more yeah. could you want in, yeah. a, in a course than that? Yeah, well, that, I think it has to be that. And it's, I, I like the fact that it's like that in first year. So at the end of your first year, you, just, you still do your own thing. Yeah. It's not, it's not for as long. But yeah, and then, you know, there's a development that goes on over years yeah. with that. And, and check this out, for the mid-years, right? Because our poor rhythm section players, they were getting so busy... Like, it's like, oh, I'm doing 18 mid-year exams. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 you can't do that. It's like, it's not fair. So what we did for the mid-years, it's like, professors, rhythm section. Yeah. So, like, literally, student turns up. Yeah. And they're like, they count the tune in. And then yeah. everyone gets exactly the same, yeah. like, thing. And they get to play with, like, I don't know, like Gareth Williams and Tom yeah. Farmer and yeah. Matt Skelton or something. And it's like, that feels, I know that feels amazing. Yeah. I know it feels amazing to it, play with absolutely. them or with, you know, That's a stunning whoever idea. it might be. You yeah. know, it's like... All of my finest memories from studying are those. We do an ensemble <coughs> and yeah. the guy leading it would be like, oh yeah, I'm going to play every yeah. tune. Yeah. You know. I know, it's the a feeling. Cool thing, isn't it? I know. There's no words for it. It's yeah. not like they were like, hey guys, we're going to play this scale now. No. It's just that feeling of playing with somebody on a different, like, astronomical plane to the yes. one you're on. Yeah. yeah you know, I don't cool, think anything it? can pull you along quite like that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I always enjoyed, like, you knew if Gareth McCrane was taking your ensemble yeah. that he'd play every tune. He'd play, yeah. And it's great. Because you'd oh. be like, all right, hose me down, Gareth. Oh, it's better than great, man. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, as a woodwind player, it must yeah. be absolutely terrifying. Yeah, I did a, <clears throat> an ensemble with him and Nadim Tamori. And oh, myself. yeah, I know Nadim. It's great, yeah. 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 And, um, and after the gig, and I know he meant nothing by this. It, it was just so funny. Or maybe he meant a lot by it. But Gareth was like, the incredible, the sensational, the quite out of this world, Nadim Tamori. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he went, on the reeds, Rob <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the greatest on moments the of my reed. life. Oh, I know, I was like, well, I'm really stood here on, on reef. <laughs> yeah, bringing up the Have bass. You got your control <laughs> exactly. to Yeah, oh my God, it was so good. But I was like, I am here with Gareth and Nadine. This yeah. is quite an, you it's know, quite cool. like, I'll take that. I'll take, I'm yeah. playing minims. In America, they call it utility woodwind. Yeah, oh, really? I love that. Great. I'm not suggesting that to you. Oh, no, that would be uh, outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> I only mean in, the, in that story, you know. Yeah, no, that... Do you know what? I didn't want to wade in and, and get too involved in my own opinions because it's so hard to be quiet um, but uh, utility woodwind is my thing because I really like yeah, it but it's one great of, it's so yeah. much fun you like you were saying about the incremental improvements yes. when you go back to being a beginner on a new instrument yeah. it's really fun really fun real quick yeah yeah but one of the best things I think I did for my own improvising 
around the time I was about 22 was to really start pushing my clarinet yeah. to improvise on rather than just the saxophone because I suddenly had no like you said that thing of like oh don't do that don't play like that like all my finger memories were gone yeah, yeah, so yeah. I had all the like it was like like having a, a semi-experienced brain yeah yeah but with but my fingers like no fallback yeah. no like two bars where I'll like yeah, play yeah. some yeah, yeah. thing that I always do in yeah. that place you know yeah. it was really a wonderful way to improve actually to try and That's get awesome. my other like even to improve on the saxophone you know just to try and start reassessing improvising yeah. on the clarinet yes can, can I start well, again stupid 12 or whatever it is. oh man that 12th key is a oh nightmare oh my god how did you yeah. do that well, it's inconvenient. The clarinet, for the listeners, like the saxophone, when you press your thumb down, your left thumb, it goes up by an octave, so it's very easy. But Record the clarinet... Yeah. clarinet goes up by a twelfth, so it takes more consideration. And you get a lot of saxophone players playing only in one half of Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And avoiding that twelfth yes, key. Yes, of course, yeah. You know? I heard a lot of that at college. And then I heard George Crowley play. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, oh, man, that's, oh, man. that's, that's it. That's, that's how yeah. you do it. And um, also. Oh, yeah, James. Oh, Joe, I've been... Uh, not that I'm anywhere near to his not level. Kirsty. Not Kirsty. Not Kirsty. <laughs> not... Who's your favourite also? <laughs> Kirsty, like James sure. Kirsty, the mints. <laughs> Definitely mints that, like, grannies have in their car. Yeah, of course. Oh, that's brilliant. Favourite also. Trying to get a fourth one. Uh, Kirsty's definitely the top for no. me. Follower. The problem I have with James is that there's loads of people like this in London, including James, where if he yeah. wasn't in London, I'd have... <laughs> <laughs> I did the Troika Orchestra once. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was great. I did one yeah. gig with them and on the bass clarinet. We had fun. And then the next gig, they booked James also oh. to play bass clarinet. And they were like, you know, I think it was um, Josh Morrison, Josh um, Josh Blackmore, sorry, said to me, uh, that's nothing personal, Rob, but, you know, James also. You know, what can I... <laughs> <laughs> it was lovely. And, of course, you can't... You can't argue with that he, logic. No, I mean, he's amazing. Yeah. So many great players. It's ridiculous. It's madness. Yeah. I have a really long list of people that I'm trying to, like... Trying to get to move. Yeah. Oh, here, yeah. Uh, Hastings is nice. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the summer after I finished college, I was I was like, Nadim Tamori moved home. James Gardner-Bateman moved back for a oh, while. Oh, yeah. Josh Arkaleo went yeah. back. You know, they all like James. And, yeah, back to Bristol, yeah. exactly. Nadim went back to Doncaster. And um, I remember Stan Saltzman saying to me, he was just going, Rob, just do anything you can to stay in London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like, you're going to cling on. You're going to yeah. make it, you know. Yeah. I was getting a few gigs and yeah. like those guys were out of town for a while. It's about two months where I was cleaning up. Brilliant. Yeah, it was great. Brilliant. It's great. That's six years ago, but <laughs> <laughs> I've been living in the past ever since. Oh. How did you decide you wanted to do jazz when you're in Perth? Like, uh, what made you? I wasn't good at classical. I like liked that. playing the piano. Is it... Uh, <laughs> Was there anything else you ever thought about doing? Nah. And you went to Guildhall as a student? Did. Was it Undergrad anything... and postgrad. Oh, lovely. Yeah. That's quite rare for jazz. I know it is rare. It's to rare for London, yeah. Two in the same I college. I know. I know. Really liked it. I kind of tried to do a postgrad as an arranger, but I think they put me down as a piano. And, right. Um, yeah. It was, it was, it, by that time, it's all kind of, it's all music anyway, isn't it? Yeah. You know? But I love writing. How did you get into the arranging side? Because you uh, do quite a lot of that work. I do tons of it, thankfully. Thank goodness. Thank you, whoever's looking after my arranging yeah. provisions. Oh, yeah, I love arranging. Always loved it. I mean, I think it helps as a piano player. Cause you've got voicings. And, and it's, it's really important. I mean, it's really important not just to put voice. I remember Pete saying, it's not just putting piano voicings on the strings, Malcolm. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I mean, yeah, it still sounds, still sounds posh, though. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So I mean, how do you learn that stuff, then? Uh, books. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, and being really into finding scores. Yeah. Like, I've been really, I'm still, like, voraciously into finding scores. Went to the BBC Music Library a month ago. Oh, my God. So excited. Ooh. It's amazing. Yeah. Pulling out all these things. I love seeing... I love seeing scores. I just love pulling them apart. Yeah. Listening, of course, but, you know, arranging's pretty, uh, there's a lot of craft in it. 
Yeah. You know, so it's quite learnable. Yeah. And I think if you if you already have uh, harmonic vocabulary and you can comp, I mean, I can comp. I think my comping is good, and I'm, my call of watches, that's what I'm good at. Right. Really good call of watch player. But there's tons of stuff I'm not. That's like an you expert. playing only with a singer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And out of time. Yeah. And like knowing the tune and following the tune without playing the tune. <laughs> yes. <coughs> and, Supporting the singer as yeah. much as you can. And having a beautiful kind of line at the top of my playing that essentially is the counter melody to the main melody. Yeah. And it's not destructive and knowing the melody so well and the singer knowing what their choices are going to be, knowing that they might, you know, leave, leaving them r- the room to to decorate it as they wish. Yeah. I love Call of Yeah. And I think that that's a very orchestral thing to do at the piano. And I think, just because I'm an old romantic, I think a lot of the, a lot of the, the sort of harmony I have just leads, it just, it, it was a natural thing to be an arranger. Yeah. Yeah. How do you find work then as an arranger? Do you have uh, like a website or no. word of mouth? Um, just write well. Yeah. Write quickly. Yeah. Be really good with artists. Yeah. You know, like just, some people think that with artists, I'm I'm talking like really famous people. Yeah. That you have to like try and be one of them, or you have to try and like sort of like no, you you don't have to. You don't have to do anything. You just have to be yourself and make them feel super comfortable. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and that's always that's always been great. I mean, I love people. I love talking to people. Yeah. And I think I think there's something that's good is that people I work with are like, oh, well, he's nice and this is easy. I'm, I did like, you know, like quite... Oh, God, I was going to say cocky now. But... I've done big projects and there hasn't been that much stuff to change. Yeah. And so I've done big things, 17 charts, and nothing changed. And yeah. I thought, that's brilliant. And the reason that nothing had to change, this was pop music. Yeah. It was that I was able to curtail my jazz sensibility. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I wasn't desperately trying to shoehorn stuff in or yeah. reharmonize it. Yeah. It was just doing the job. Yeah. And I think I'm a good arranger because I'm a good craftsman. And that's, and and, I th- and the reason I'm not like a, I'm not a composer like uh, Trish Clues or uh, Lockhart. Yeah. I'm not a composer in the in the way that they are. Yeah. Because I don't have no, really that imagination and patience. Right. <clears throat> you know. Yeah. I'm really good at task based stuff. Yeah. So if you're listening and you can and you understand harmony and you are good at like kind of following instructions that you've learned to follow yeah check out arranging right it's very satisfying yeah <coughs> the musician's version of being in the army oh uh, <laughs> no I'm not doesn't sure. work <laughs> well yeah I guess I don't I, know I guess I've not been in the army but, no uh, well I haven't no but nothing not yeah. that there's anything remotely like being in the army in music but I think it's. I think the thing is about being a ranger is that you're useful. Must be really fun to get to like see behind the curtain of the pop industry as love well. It. Yeah, yeah, absolutely love it. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. And stuff happens so quickly. <laughs> really? Yeah. So, yeah. What, what do you mean, like, like someone might? You're talking like needing arrangements in like no, well, five hours' time, I, or I went to like a, a, a big name pop star's house to routine a song on a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And then a week, Monday... And they're giving you their opinion while you're playing, like, oh, you yeah. have this? Yeah, song. exactly. I want it to yeah. sound like this And what thing. I do, whenever someone says, I want to do this on, they always send me an MP3 or other formats are available. And, uh, like, I'll always, like, write it out, do a full lead sheet with yeah. exactly what they play, the harmony, the, the lyrics and the melody. Yeah. And I'll always turn up with that and two copies, one for them. Right. You know, yeah. and that's and everyone goes like, "Oh, this is great" because they can see it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and then we'll start marking it up. Change this here, like two four bar here. Let's have some extra chords. We need this little frill, and then I'll take that home and I'll have this sort of five page, you know, like a conductor's part, full of all these ideas, like woodwind here, like yeah. a gliss there. And these ideas in. have all come from like a collaboration. You're just chatting away. Yeah. 
Yeah. You throw stuff against the wall and see what yeah. they like. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then sometimes, you know, like I'll record a piano part for it and I'll say, oh, get me up some Spitfire strings or something. And yeah. I'll, I'll just like play a pad in, play yeah. a string. Oh, I like that. Keep that. Yeah. Less dense there. You know, just the cellos, you know. Yeah. And then, so we did this on a, on a Wednesday and then a week Monday we were in British Grove with an orchestra. Yeah. 21 strings, four French horns, three flutes, two C, uh, one C, two alto. Nice. Ooh, oh, two alto flutes. So Lovely. Beautiful. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And then, so that's it. It's like 10 days. Yeah. Wow. Okay, that's done. That's three charts done. Yeah. And I, and well, we had two charts for that. And uh, the artist called me the night before and went, oh, we might have some extra time at the session, so could you do anything with this? And sent me an arrangement that I'd played on that my friend Tom Richards, who's the most amazing writer who I know you'll know, he had done this big band arrangement. He said, could you put strings on this? And I got to the studio at 9 o'clock. And when the artist walked in at 9.45, chart was done. Wow. And then we recorded it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds really good. Yeah. You know? It's like, it's not necessarily rocket science. Yeah. Because it's, it, it is exactly what it needed to be. Yeah. But it's, it, I, I, I'm pleased to be able to do that. Yeah. To be speedy. And you yeah. can learn that. That's totally honable. Yeah. You know, you need to be great with Sibelius. Yeah. You need to like have all your shortcuts. You need to have all your parts preset. So you never have to do any of that faffing around. Yeah. You know, once you get a workflow, boom. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And people like that. People in the pop world, particularly when they're spending five figure sums on a three hour session, they want it to be fast, they want it to be good, and they want it to be organized. Yeah. And if you are those things, then you will work. Yeah. It's easy. Yeah. And you make everyone feel good. I always always make every player feel great, you know. Yeah. Well I try to. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's, and I was always say to Amy, who fixes for me at Isabel Griffith's office, they're amazing, they're like the best. I always say, like, Amy, just get the nice players, just get the nicest people, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, just please, just get the lovely people. And of course, I, actually, almost everyone's lovely. Have you noticed yeah. this? Like, these days, like, they, it, used, it used to be a thing where there was some quite difficult people you know, yeah. and I, I remember being really intimidated when I started doing big sessions. And yeah. Absolutely bricking myself. I notice now there's this whole, like, like, yeah, like people our age can't afford to be like that. No. Yeah. No, I, I was really struck by that as soon as I moved here. Everyone's so lovely. Yeah. I'm really yeah. supportive of each other. Yeah. It's not a competitive scene. It's not, no. It can't be. It can't be, really. Cause yeah. Because and, and part of that is when we've come back to jazz and creative music, like we need to support each other's gigs. Yeah. So yeah, and that's a lovely thing you see happening at like the Oxford or yeah, uh, yeah. you know any number of venues like that. Yeah. And it's like it's a great thing where people support each other. Yeah. They want to hear the music. Do you ever get artists giving you really bad suggestions that you know are bad, and you're like, no. And they're still like, no, this is, I don't know. Because I don't know with pop how, like, musically, like, some people must be considerably more talented than others. Yeah, I guess I've been really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes people are. I think the only time I've been kind of people being difficult is because they've been insecure themselves about right. a song. So if it's not their song and, like, it's a thrown together thing of, like, we're going to play the music of whichever decade or whatever and it's like someone's been assigned a song and they're not that confident about it yeah you know you can you can you kind of have to be like a bit cotton woolly and yeah and, and help without seeming like you're being patronising because yeah. you're obviously a big star and an amazing singer yeah but yeah I mean I think I think when I think you find the people with whom you're going to have like positive symbiotic right, relationships yeah. and if there's any kind of and I guess those people then you really want to work with again and they want to work with you exactly. and you're really on to something yeah you just have to become people's like go to really yeah that's it and not try and do everything yeah you know like I mean I can write for lots of different ensembles but I'm a good string writer yeah you know so that's strings and woodwinds and kind of orchestral so you know 
fine, big band charts, great, I can do that. But there's other people who are like really, really great. Like yeah. Tom Richards, a ridiculous big band player. It's brilliant. You yeah. Know? So I'm not necessarily going to do everything all the time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm talking about in a, in a pop pop sort of thing. Yeah. The way he kind of he gets away with so much, he kind of finds all these corners. It's like the coolest thing ever. Yeah. It's like, wow, yeah. How did you get that through? Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's cool. I mean, I, I, you know, I've written a lot of like I've orchestrated for a lot of jazz music as well, and a creative thing like yeah. Ian Bellamy and just sitting with Yaz Ahmed. I did, she had tons of good, great material, and there's a few more and Mike Walker and uh, like all sorts of people who work with because I run a youth jazz organisation in Scotland as well, right. and get an artist every year, and uh, it's it's a really great thing. It's like a it's like the metropole model like get an artist and they choose they give you their repertoire they want to do Leanne Carroll did it it was amazing of course she's my favourite yeah. she's the best Yeah, I think she's like pretty much she's just the best if know. you type your name into Facebook go on the only things that come up are Leanne Carroll oh, posts yeah that's nice yeah yeah I don't do Facebook I have a yeah. dormant account oh uh, okay I like Twitter yeah. And I have limited time. Yeah. So, yeah. And the Facebook thing was like, I mean, I found it when I was younger and definitely sort of like less confident, but I found it really kind of destructive. Right. Just thinking, like, oh, well, I'm not doing that. Oh. Mm. And I, I, I know people will be thinking, well, that's fine for you to say because you've got tons of work and, and uh, that's hypocritical. And, and I try not to be like that on Twitter, but I'm sure lots of people are going like, oh, don't be an idiot. We don't need to know you're doing this. So I can I can totally see that I'm part of the problem. So maybe I should come off social media. No. No, it's hard, isn't on. it? It's hard, though. It's really... I don't... I feel really conflicted by it. I just like positive stuff, and I try not to... Try not to be like, oh, look at me. I just try to be like, here's the thing that's interesting. Yeah. If you like me, you might like it. You know, that's it. But yeah. I find Facebook just... Oh, it's just yeah, I, I feel like sometimes people just forget the audience that they're preaching to. Yeah, well, that know? must be interesting in, in this podcast world as well. It's yeah. Like quite a disparate audience, I would imagine. Yes. Musicians and music fans. And yeah. Maybe some people with not much connection to music just are interested. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. It must be quite humbling in a way, you know, to get feedback from people from different backgrounds. Yeah, it is. It is really... I think is really... In terms of the audience, like... You know, I just really like people's stories. Yes. That's the story is what yeah. makes it interesting, but that's universally appealing. Yes. You know? Yeah, totally. Like, so... I, I, yeah, I just quite... I, I like, like I said before we started I just asked questions that I think are interesting yeah yeah. because I'm genuinely interested because you're genuinely in the interested yeah but that tends to work for a broad audience yes. as well yeah definitely because don't go down too many inaccessible rabbit holes I think that's you know? important yeah yeah absolutely and like yeah but yeah the Facebook thing I go back and forth about you know because sometimes I think like you say it does an awful lot of harm so there needs to be a balance because if you're only ever putting out the things that you're doing really successfully yeah. or every time you have a gig then it's I don't know it's kind of not fair on other people that are using the platform I, I feel. know and, and then of course like like Trish Clues has got a great social media account she does because she's got cool things going on and we know about yeah. it but yeah. also like 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 sometimes it's just like a normal human post like I'm on holiday yeah. and that's a bit of a weird example but it's not like too corporate I feel like Trish yes. remembers that there's friends and other musicians on there yeah. but I don't need smacking over the head yes. about like how many Radio 3 gig like because yeah. that's awesome and I'll yeah. check that out anyway yeah. but I think it's just I don't know maybe... yeah that's a very good example yeah. she's, she's really great she's great she's great yeah <laughs> yeah but makes stuff happen it's got I think someone like Trish because she really grafts then it's probably I can't imagine people would be like oh, oh this again because she's really worked for everything you know yeah. it's not like yeah you know really respect that 
Yeah, it's it's. I know. I, I thought about it. I'd love to delete my Facebook, but it's been so great for the podcast. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that I yeah. feel like just you know, I don't know. And with Facebook Live, it's had a bit of a renaissance as well. Like, yeah, it's yeah. kind of useful. It's, it's 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 much better than a kind of like modern friends reunited which it kind of started there. <laughs> yeah yeah totally totally um so what's coming up in the near future okay so got, start of a new term yeah start a new term two weeks got some arrangements for my pals at the bbc console orchestra to do that's very exciting uh arranging for gary barlow that's very very exciting yeah that's really cool it's really cool he's lovely it's ridiculous so talented i mean that's not the biggest thing to see Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't. Oh my I don't god! Know. I don't know his music oh that well, god. but this is what I mean about peeling back the curtain. You know, I love to know it's these things. It's ridiculous. His piano playing, yeah, and his songwriting. How is he so good? His instinct for his instinct for like a song, his lyrics. Oh my yeah. god! They're like they cut you in two. They're amazing. Yeah. I yeah. mean, honestly, honestly, it's ridiculous. He's, he's amazing. You know, yeah. super nice. It's super, so easy to work with. Do you think a lot of that is instinct? These abilities? Because well, it's a hard thing to learn. I, I don't know, he was so successful so young, so I don't, yeah. know, where, I don't know where he got it all from. Yeah. Uh, I guess, like, listen to tons of music and it's, yeah. it's very original. It's very... Yeah. Uh, it's, it's like, he's one of the architects of, sort of modern pop music. I mean, his... Yeah. His songs, because people forget, because he wrote all the take that stuff. And yeah. When they would come off tour, I think there was quite a lot of like, you know, he he would be straight back to work. Yeah. You know. Yeah. He'd be like, you know, the others could go and relax, and he'd be yeah. like, right, okay, here we go. Time you know. to write. Yeah. But he's he works so hard. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's great. So I'm really excited about that coming out. He announced yeah. the album a few weeks ago. So oh, it's, great! It's it's a long wait. It's autumn 2020, folks. Wow, cool! But some lovely sounds. Amazing. Lovely sounds. Amazing. Well, Malcolm, thank you so much. Rob, it's been an utter coming. joy. Yeah, thank it has you been so much. It has been. I've loved it. I've loved it too. And I hope your dear listeners found it interesting. I am certain that they have. They'd be very... And I'd love to hear from anyone at Arranger's Piano. It's a little joke, because mm -hmm. Arranger's Piano is like bad piano that arrangers play, where they play everything that they've already written on the piano, just in case the players forget to play it. Oh, I see. oh yeah. That's yeah. a little joke, yeah. Filling in. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, yeah, great to hear from anyone, always. And anyone interested in studying jazz. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Sick. Well done. Next month, wow. next month is going to be Daniel Bennett, a New York-based um, woodwind player, saxophone, flute, oboe. He's been in London playing his album launch at Ronnie's. Okay. Um, so we had a little chat to right. commemorate it. But um, I'm going to aim to do that show in a month because then I can unpack some boxes. Right. You know, sort my life. You've been out. saying you want to do it for every month for uh, years. I have. Do you know what? I've actually... Yeah, and you're right. And then you, right. like, call me a few days later and it's like, let's do another one. Um, I think I've finally got it down to monthly. Right, great. I know. Then we can have some time off and enjoy each other's yeah. wondrous company. Yeah. Um, I've had to say, actually, you know, to, to tell people just to wait till next year. Because um, right. it's, uh, it's, you know... That's the thing, is if you've got time, it's really hard to say no. And yeah. just keeps on, the tsunami just never stops. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah. So next month, Daniel Bennett. And then the month after mm. is uh, Robert Mitchell, pianist. Oh, great. Pianist. Yeah. When are we, aren't we squeezing one of you in? Oh, yeah, maybe we can do that as well. We should meet up and do it at the climbing wall whilst climbing. Sounds good. Let's do that. All right. That sounds wonderful. Um, right. Well, thank you for listening to the Jazz Podcast. We hope you have a lovely um, month or week or some whatever this gap turns out to be. Yeah. Well. All right. Farewell, lads. Next one. Bye. In a bit.